Hey. So, as I, uh, I got a notification in my comments asking, do you still play? Yeah, I've been playing this whole time. <laughs> I just haven't been playing, um, I just haven't been playing on YouTube very much. Actually, at all. Um, the reason why I don't play on there much anymore is just because time. It's easier to do computer videos and stuff. Mostly that and up until recently I kind of had an alter ego and a band that I had to carry and all that kind of stuff. So I figured it's long overdue since I've been kicking up the activity on my channel to do a guitar video. So yeah, we're going to talk about the Eddie Van Halen Bumblebee Tribute Jag. <clears throat> and there's a long story behind this guitar. So, let's go back to how I got... Well, let's go back to how this project got started. So, it was about... Um, October of last year. I mean, it, it, it's clearly obvious I'm a Van Halen fan. I mean, you know, I do all this on my own. Yeah, that's like my style. <laughs> I do that all the freaking time. So, so of course, my social media blew up. All my friends, especially the ones from high school, were like calling, were like sending me, sorry, my Eddie Van Halen died. And I, and I was pretty silent. I, I don't talk much on Facebook because I'm not a fan of Facebook. I actually quite well hate Facebook. I'm only on there because friends and family. I mean, if there was an alternate social media network I could move to, I probably would. I'm, I still miss MySpace. Remember MySpace? You could go in there, you could edit your profile, I could post my music on there, and like have a playlist, so if someone said, ah, I don't like this track, they can check out the other one. It's like Band Labs replaced that. Um, so yeah, that's kind of where the nucleus got started, and... Me and the wife started building guitars together, and she started painting them, and I've been building bodies out the wazoo, so... I was sitting there, and I was thinking, well, I do need to do something. I didn't do a social media post at all. I didn't even, you know, I didn't even do a simple post. I was just like, you know, I want to do something, but I want to do it in my own way, because I'm not, I'm not a speech person much. I, I love Instagram more than I do Facebook, even though it's the same. Uh, chicanerous company. I prefer Instagram just because I don't have to talk so much. Just put a little blurb on the bottom and I have a picture up top of whatever the heck it is I'm working on and there you go. So that's how this project got started, but there's a little more to it than just the guitar. Okay, so we're going to start with how I got into Van Halen. Um, and I kind of been a little inspired by watching several different YouTubers going on about, you know, their music preferences. A lot of them have been gamers, so it's been an interesting slant. Um, I mean, like, one of them, Bithead 1000, uh, I think it was, uh, one or two of the other guys were talking about, like, Atari VCS stuff. I've been watching, binge-watching Bithead 1000, though, so... <clears throat> The, the story of the Van Halen build started kind of like this. So it was about November, and I was like, eh, yeah, I might want to... I kind of missed the guitar I had in high school. And explain where that got started. Okay, so actually, y'all will probably want to know, how did I get started in building guitars? I got started when I was about 14, 13, 14, 15 years old. I can't even remember it was that long ago. And I have a good memory, so... <laughs> I started with a Harmony H80T Strat copy that I bought off of a classmate named Jim for 10 bucks. It was a Sunburst Strat. It was a copy of a Fender Strat that you bought out of like the JC Penny catalog, the little wish book they'd send out every year. You can call that like three inch thick mega catalog, small, little. <laughs> so I, uh, had that, I stripped it, I repainted it turquoise, um, I put plexiglass I found on the side of um, Frederick Road and made a pit guard for it. It looked kind of like uh, kind of like I was trying to rip off uh, Billy Joe Armstrong's Fernandez Strat Old Blue, <laughs> except with a clear pit guard. 
And I brought this thing in a class and it sounded fan-freaking-tastic. And around, and around this time, I was just getting into building guitars. And the person who really inspired me to get into guitar building first was actually Paul Dean from Loverboy. Um, which, yeah, you're never going to hear the end of that guy on this channel. I mean, that, that, that was one of my, my top five influences on guitar would be Kurt Cobain, Billy Gibbons, Paul Dean, Brad Gillis, and Eddie Van Halen. And so, before I really knew it was up with Van Halen, I knew it was up with Loverboy. You know, Paul Dean, that's, shoot, I should bring that guitar up here. <clears throat> Paul Dean designed and built this thing. Uh, he called it the Dean Machine. Odyssey Guitars made their own version of this. Uh, well, he commissioned Odyssey Guitars to copy this. And then, you know, this was based off of his old Stratocaster, which he put together. And I read the article. It was, uh, I think it was, I can't remember if it was March or September 1983. It's called Women Who Rock. As like the lead singer of Girl School on the front with her cool gold Les Paul. And I was like, and I was like, okay. And of course, the article is Paul Dean, lead lover boy. You might be able to find a print version of it on Tammy's Lover Boy website online. But I read it and he was like, yeah, I had this old Stratocaster and I routed out the back with a chisel and put plastic wood, that plastic wood back there. And you know, I, I smashed it imitating Townsend, so I glued the neck back together, and there was a break at the 10th fret that gave it a certain resonance, and so I tried to re he tried to recreate it on this guitar by putting, you know, cha the chambered neck and the 10-degree headstock tilt and all that, which were all features uh, Paul Dean adopted from his Stratocaster uh, guitar that he was using on the first Loverboy record, and probably on the Streetheart record. So that led me down the path to kind of going, okay, well, Paul Dean's building guitars out of whatever the heck he can get his hands on. What's stopping me from doing it? I'm like, I'm, I'm fairly handy. You know, that, at that point, I was already doing some of the electronic stuff I do. I was doing, I was rebuilding Atari consoles, you know, like buying up Atari 2600s at thrift shops and taking them apart and putting them together and sometimes slapping different parts together. Yeah, that's a story for another day. So, I started doing that with guitars. I bought a Harmony H80T off Classmate <clears throat> Jim. Another guy named Wade sold me his Harmony H804, which kind of started my madness with that. So I started building, and all my designs was just messing around with stuff. And then for the third guitar, first guitar I ever built that had a homemade body on it, was basically a repro basically the original version of this, which wasn't too much different actually. What it is is I wanted a Fender Jaguar really bad, really bad. I mean, I would go to guitar shops and I would get. I remember one time I went in Crossroad Music. They had a '62 reissue Fender Jaguar hanging in the back, and I was like, "Can I try that out?" He's like, "Sorry, it's in to be repaired." This this was my life. Back when, this was what growing up as a teenager was. Offsets weren't in every corner store like they are now. You didn't have the VM series. You didn't have that. You had two different ways to get a Fender Jaguar or Jazzmaster. You had to go to, you either had to special order a 62 reissue from Japan, and you had to wait for months for it to come in. You had to spend over $600 for it, which compared to what you pay for like a Squire that's, you know, almost comparable it, 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 the Squire is more value than the Japanese guitar actually was in some respects. But then, on the other hand, you could go buy a vintage one. And so, but a vintage one was 1500 bucks because Kurt Cobain drove the prices up. So, I was like, okay, well, I'm going to build my own Jaguar. And at the time, this is where we get into where I got into Van Halen. Very strange mixture. So I got into Van Halen this way. There was a kid at school, but see, this is the thing you gotta understand. I'm the generation that, when I was a teenager, it was the late 90s, early 2000s. Van Halen was over to everybody at that time. Nobody wanted to hear Van Halen. Everybody wanted to hear, you know, like Oasis, or Matchbox 20, or Sum 41, or Sublime, or maybe, you know, the more vintage Red Hot Chili Peppers or the next Pearl Jam album. 
And if you were a real guitar head, you were into blues music like Stevie Ray Vaughan or, you know, Eric Clapton. So, and I lived in the Deep South, so of course Leonard Skinner's always in vogue. So, <clears throat> what ended up happening was I was going to school there and, you know, I was getting, getting, getting into playing for my classmates. So when my classmates were around, I was playing, you know, the, I was playing like Nirvana, which was power chords, you know, was, you know. You know, you had all that kind of stuff. Yeah, but, yeah it's a shit show right now. <laughs> I didn't tune it up. So, story, story, long story short, I was into the wrong music at the wrong time because I had older sisters who were Gen X. They were into, you know, White Snake, Van Halen, Def Leppard. Well, one of them was. The other one was more into whatever was pop at the time, I guess, or not even really into music. So... I, I had gotten back to my 80s roots. I'd gotten off grunge. I was kind of tired of it by that point. So I went went looking at 80s bands, and I got into Loverboy, uh, Journey, that's another influence, Neil Sean, and Night Ranger. And those were like my three bands. But the thing about Loverboy, Loverboy has a lot of simple, simple stuff that's a lot of power chords. So when I was in front of my classmate friends, I was always, you know, you know, playing Nirvana. But when I was in the back room, I was playing like, you know, Loverboy, you know. You know, that kind of stuff. So one day I'm back there in the band. I, I was in the high school band. I played trumpet. And I was in the back room playing guitar. I was just playing when it's over. You know. And I was playing it on my friend's guitar. And one of those blues guys, he just picks up a mic stand like this. Says, "If you play Nirvana again, I'm gonna kill you." I'm like, "What the, f dude? That's not even Nirvana, Slover Boy." He's like, "I don't give a shit what it is." I'm like, you know, it's like you're playing faggot music or whatever. This this is something I never got about the '90s. Did, did, there were fan there were fans of Nirvana who were like this. I, I get Kurt Cobain's note in the Incesticide liner notes totally, because I went to school with these kids and they were making fun of me for like an '80s stuff like the Cars and Mister Mister and Lover Boy and ZZ Top. <sighs> They were calling me queer over it, but yeah, of course they listened to the most LGBTQ. Um, or whatever the acronym is this week, please correct me if I'm wrong, that they were, they were the most, the band was the most supportive of it, but the fans were horrid. I went to school with this trash. So yeah, you can see how I kind of became my own person and started listening to 80s rock again after that. I was just like, yeah, the, the 80s, 90s, bad memories. So, that's how I got into Van Halen. But he, he did other stuff to me. Into a girl. We're on a band trip. He goes up to everybody and just basically says, Mike likes blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, you know how it gets when you're a teenager and you're in, into someone and you don't want anybody to freaking know that you're into that person? Or at least you just don't want to go spreading around gossip. So this dipshit fucking does this. And I was like, all right, all right, all right. The kid gloves are off. The freaking fighting gloves are on. I'm like, okay, you want to fight dirty? I'm going to fight you at the one thing you don't know. Because he picked up a freaking guitar one day, just ripped it out of my hands, tried to play scuttle button. It sounded like... And I was like, I was like, dude, no. So, by this point, I was mad, so... We were on this trip, we were in Myrtle Beach. There was a music shop in the mall. I went to the music shop and I was like, okay. And I, I had been ogling the Jagmasters and all that the whole time I'd been there. But I was like, hmm, I saw this thing full of VHS. Never learned from a VHS tape before. I've always had either a legitimate instructor or taught myself. So I looked through and there were these tapes that were like, play guitar in the style of Pearl Jam, play guitar in the style of Nirvana. And I saw one, it was purple, and it had the Frankenstrat on the front, and it said, Guitar in the style of Eddie Van Halen with Kurt Mitchell. Oh, man. And it was awesome, because, you know, I already kind of knew some of the stuff. You know, I did one of the first things I figured out was, like, running with the devil. <laughs> so I had that. 
and all that kind of stuff. And he, he did, I, I got it. You got a VHS tape. It had a little folded up piece of paper in it, and it had, you know, the tape itself. And it was like this low product. It looked like Kurt Mitchell was in the back of a guitar shop playing a Boogie Bodies home built guitar through a rig that was set up to sound like Eddie Van Halen's uh, Marshall Plexi Super Lead and all that stuff in the back. And he was like talking about the the uh, Eventide Harmonizer and Jape. If you wonder where the chorus came from in my sound, that's part of where I got it from was listening to Kurt Mitchell. And he was talking about uh, the Jape setting on the Eventide Harmonizer that Eddie Van Halen had, <clears throat> which through all this, uh, after he passed, I found another interview talking about how he started doing that because he was mad that um, when somebody bought a tape if they had like a janky old car with one speaker that worked or an old mono boom box that wasn't pro properly wired you could only hear michael anthony's bass and the drums but you couldn't hear ed's guitar so he did that so his guitar would be split in the stereo and you could hear it in both speakers so you could always hear ed's guitar no matter what janky stereo system you were listening to van halen on so <clears throat> I, I learned a lot from that tape, and I mean, I practiced it religiously, religiously over the summer. So that's how I got into Van Halen, and then, you know, my buddy Jesse had Van Halen too, so I borrowed his CD, and I went to Blockbuster Music the next weekend and bought that, bought Fair Warning, bought Diver Down, I already had 1984 on cassette. I went out and bought OU812 on my trip trip down to Florida. So I was like sitting in the back of the car with a Walkman on listening to OU812. Um, tried to get my hands on For Unlawful Carnal Knowledge and came up short a few bucks so I couldn't buy it. Um, bought the greatest hits. I mean, I, I bought everything Van Halen during that time. I was crazy. I even played one of the uh, original PV Wolfgang specials when they first came out, and I was quite impressed with it. That was when I bought my Epiphone amp I had at the time. So that's kind of how the Van Halen thing kind of got started. But around that time, I was getting into building guitars, and I was like, what would be a good simple guitar I could build at the beginning? Now let's move back to Van Halen too. On the back cover, Ed's holding the Bumblebee. This is a guitar that was made by Charvel. It was rear-routed, so the pickup was, you know, mounted. It was rear-routed, and so it didn't have a pick guard, and it had, you know, maple neck, strat headstock. It had one of the original Floyd Rose tremolos on it, one of the ones without fine tuners. So I was thinking, you know, the Bumblebee, or at least my own kind of version of it that isn't exactly like Ed's would be perfect. Because I always read Ed's interviews and he was always getting irritated with people copying him outright. And I didn't want to copy him outright. I was like, you know, at the same time, I'm trying to cultivate my own style here. I don't want to be the guy known as that Eddie Van Halen impersonator with a, you know, Eddie Van Halen guitar. So <clears throat> I thought, what ways can I make this original? I'm like, well... I like Jaguars, I like Jazz Masters, I have a big, I just learned in, I think it was math class or algebra class, they taught us how to scale up photographs by drawing lines through a picture. Yeah, as much as some of you people who might have gone to school with me think I wasn't paying attention, I actually was. I just didn't give a shit. <laughs> so, <clears throat> I get into math, I, I go home, I open up American Guitars it's by Tom Tony Bacon and Paul Day, which head. is like this inch thick book like every american guitar manufacturer from like the 30s 40s 50s 60s they have like everything in there acoustics electrics anything you dream of great book and i desecrated it by flipping to the page of the leo fender interview where they have a picture of uh john entwistle's fender jazz master because john entwistle of the who had like a massive guitar collection and he provided a bunch of photos and and i'm just sitting there drawing lines through it trying to get it just right <laughs> I'm just like, come on, I was sitting there with a ruler. Just So now I had like this 58 Sunburst Jazzmaster picture with lines through it. And I'm sitting here with a giant, with a bunch of printer paper on the floor, all taped together, trying to draw the exact same shape out. What resulted was something about right. It, it, it looked like a Jazzmaster, kind of. But it was a little oversized. By a little oversized, I mean the butt hung out a little too much. It was about this much longer. It was about that much wider. And this horn stuck up like here. It looked like an exaggerated cartoon jazz master. So I 
went out to seek wood. Now, I was a penniless high school student at the time, and much to my luck, as with everything, it has to be the hardest way possible. So I'm roaming around the neighborhood. There's no wood. I roam around my, I roam around, look in the shed. I have nothing big enough to make a guitar out of. And I'm just like, okay, well, how am I gonna make this? I know. So I go over to Lowe's and I'm roaming around, thinking I could buy a two by four for like five bucks and saw it up into three pieces and glue three or four pieces and glue it together and then make the guitar body. And so. I went all around and then I found like this pile of lumber sitting by there's like a back part of Lowe's where they have the trimming and they have like these little plastic doors hanging, little plastic things hanging down, like the forklifts drive in and out of in the lumber yard section. I just saw this pile of lumber. I just went ahead and asked a guy, he said, oh, you can have it for free. So I just took it and wandered out of the store with it, took it home, glued it glued it together cut out the body with a jigsaw and a scroll saw hand scroll saw so that was a lot of work then i had to route it which i was using a dremel moto tool with a, the crappy dremel router base on it and i had to cut out all that and of course i was like i, I wanted to keep true to the van halen thing so i was going to put a stratocaster trem in it because i wanted to keep the parts easy to get so i could just go to the store get the parts put the guitar together Bought some black and yellow paint, uh, grabbed some masking tape, and the one thing I'd forgotten to do is worry about hardware. So I took my old Harmony H80T Strat apart and I put the neck from that on here on the guitar. And then I was like, I need a humbucker. I went to Crossroad Music and they didn't have any humbuckers for sale that were cheaper than like 80 bucks. Went to the guitar shop. They had nice stuff that I would have wanted to buy, but I couldn't afford it. So I went, okay, I'm gonna go to, I'm gonna go. And I looked in uh, my other guitar book, the guitar handbook, and I looked through there and there was a section on how humbuckers worked. And it said, you know, humbuckers are basically uh, two single coils put together, wired in series, but with one magnet. And I went, okay, well, wonder what happens if you have two magnets. So I wired two Stratocaster pickups together, drilled two extra holes into a pickup trim ring, stuck the pickup in that way, and then I put a strat, the strat bridge from the H80T on it with the same neck, because I got my old neck back. And <clears throat> when I did this, I had all spray paint all put together. All did, it was pretty much similar to this, but this is actually a proper shape. So what ended up happening, and oh, I had the strap bridge on there and I kept tightening the strings and it kept lifting up like this. And I kept putting more springs in the back and then all of a sudden I saw that the pine, southern yellow pine I was using, just started bending up and breaking off. I was like, oh crap. So, one of the original things on this guitar, from that guitar, is the bridge. Gibson branded. Um, Super Tune Vibrola is a advertise it, but it's really a Kaler uh, vibrato. And yeah, so I put that on there and I bolted it on. It originally was held on with a set of Briggs and Stratton cylinder head bolts off of a 3.75 horsepower Briggs and Stratton engine off a 22 inch Southland lawnmower. And so that was how the original came together. It was made out of, I think, one strip of pressure treated pine and like three strips of just regular southern yellow pine. It was very light like this, um, very comfy. Yeah, the Harmony H80T 21 fret neck on it. It had the stupid cheapo crown tuners on it. It's a little different from this one. This is actually a quality instrument. So I had this thing built and I like brought it to school and carried it around for a while. And then later I had an idea to make a bass VI out of it and the neck broke. So I was like, okay. So I gave up on it. But we're coming around here and Ed passed away. I was like, you know, I kind of like to have that guitar back, but with a properly shaped body and actually built with the skills I have now. Cause I, you know, I've been, I'm 37 now. I've been doing this since I was, you know, 13 years old. So of course my skill set has grown. I mean, I've gone from building something completely hacked together like that to, you know, something like this. It's actually a decent instrument. So I'm like, okay, well, I want to reprise the Van Halen Jag. And I went and dug through my parts bins. And I was like, well, I still have my old Kaler. I have this Bill Lawrence humbucker. 
have an MXR style knob, why not build it? So then came the problem wood. I was like, okay, how am I gonna build this thing to be similar to what it originally, the original one? And I thought, you know, eh, where I live, there's like an entire field where people are throwing lumber and crap. And I thought, I'm pretty sure I can find a piece of lumber out there I could saw up and make a body out of. So I did, I sawed, uh, I sawed up a piece of cedar fence post that it was just laying around. It had a little bit of rot and damage in it. And I just sawed it up, glued it together, took a few multiple pieces, um, planed it as well as I could. I tried to do this kind of rushy because I wanted to get it done before the end of the year so I could open up my uh, work to another guitar. And this is what resulted. The body shape this time was traced from my 62 reissue Jaguar that I freaking adore. Um, and it was painted with $1 rattle can paint. Well, the yellow is actually Rust-Oleum uh, yellow primer and uh, paint mix, but the black is actually like $1 cheap bottom of the shelf Lowe's black rattle can paint. Um, as a Bill Lawrence 500 humbucker in the bridge, um, Gibson branded Kaler, 500K pot with the MXR knob on it. It's open route in the back, just like Ed's, except mine's just a circular hole that I hand routed. Uh, the pickup screwed into the wood like Ed's guitars, but I did it my own way where it goes through the back. Uh, standard neck plate. Uh, the neck is the uh, War Moth neck off my Jagmaster. Um, the tuners, shalers, locking nut Floyd Rose R2. Um, through the neck style locking nut. I mean, you know, the, it, it came together and it just sounds great. And I did one thing that the original didn't have. I put the eye bolts on here because I was like, yeah. First I was like, should I get strap locks? But there's some significance to the parts. I mean, the Kaler was what the original had. There's a dime bag connection there because the original Bumblebee was buried with dime bag Daryl and dime bag had XL 500s in the bridge of his Dean MLs. So I put that in here. Um, yeah, as you know, bare wood maple neck, just like Eddie would have had, you know, this, is, this has no finish on it. It's going to look worn out in a while. I painted the headstock to kind of match, but it got a little jacked up, but I kind of like it that way. It just looks cool. Uh, kind of an interesting, uh, look to it. And I mean, the whole thing stays in tune and plays really well. <laughs> Pedal board needs some work. 
Yeah, I mean, that. yeah, I've got a few bad cables on my pedal board right now, I'm working on. But yeah, I mean, that's pretty much what it sounds like. <laughs> I mean, I, I wanted to build it so it would be my own kind of guitar, while at the same time kind of paying a nod, you know? So that's what it is. It's a jazz master that's Van Halenized. So, I mean, that <laughs> that's really what I've been up to. I've been up to building, I've been up to playing, but I do more of my playing on Band Lab. And that's what I do. Uh, probably need to get a bit more in practice with the Van Halen stuff. Something I'm thinking about doing with videos on here for too long. And yeah, so my stupid video cut out. <laughs> Maybe I'm running out of space. I don't know. But yeah, I mean, this is the thing. Expect to see more of me. I'm just playing that. Um, so you know what I'm playing through in this video. I'm playing through the Bugera 333XL and my um, analog pedal board down here. So you can see. So yeah, I'm still playing. Still playing quite a bit. So yeah, anyway, um, this is Creepy Net signing out. I'll see you in the next video.